St. John Paul II and St. Marcel the Moderate, part three on the Meaning of Catholic Guild Family Stream. Jesus is King! Everybody, welcome to the Guild Family Stream. I'm Timothy Flanders. This is the Meaning of Catholic. I'm streaming today from Flanders Family Trapping Company, Deer Camp. As you can see, there's the buck. <laughs> Uh, I'm at my at my parents' house hunting, so uh, we're uh, a special studio appearance over here. Um, haven't haven't taken any shots yet, but we'll see. Asking Saint Anthony to find some meat for us, but we'll see. Um, today's stream is part three of a series we're doing, uh, which is attempting to present a sympathetic, objective portrait and view of two men, Marcel Lefebvre and St. John Paul II, uh, the Pope, Carol Wojtyla. And this is, there are reasons that we've, in part one, we talked about all the reasons for this, reason that we're doing these two men in particular. It's because these two men in particular have had uh, a great deal of strong followers who love and venerate them and as a result of that, there has been um, also a caricature to a degree, sometimes made unjustly towards from, from followers of one man to the followers of the other man or the, the man himself. So in keeping with the mission of being a Catholic, these two men, we're, we're examining them both uh, sympathetically and objectively, uh, not avoiding criticisms either. Uh, trying to, but making those criticisms from a place of understanding so that we really understand what these men were about. What did they really teach? What did they really do? What were their motivations? What were their intentions? And today's show, we'll be talking about the fact that John Paul II is not a phenomenologist. Uh, this is a very common misconception among English speakers because of a particular Anglophone uh, reality of John Paul II's work. Uh, we've already talked about problems with George Weigel's biography. So that's another Anglophone issue. There's, there's Anglophone issues with John Paul II. So it's, it makes sense that he's actually misunderstood based on these various Anglophone issues. So we'll talk about those today. And um, we'll also address some of the controversies with this series. Um, this part of the series right now will be made public. So I just want to say a few things publicly and if you want the full presentation, you do need to become a guild member. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic. Uh, let me tell you what the presentation is going to be, though. Uh, I, don't, I don't even know if we'll have time for all of this today. We might need to do this, this particular section of our series in multiple parts. But uh, let me see. First of all, let me see if I can make this larger. Okay, so we'll have a, a, first of all, we'll talk some uh, about the controversy. That'll be the public portion so we can address some of the controversies that have arisen with this particular series. Um, and uh, we'll talk about can Lefebvre be called a saint? Can we venerate him? Um, John Paul II's heroic sanctity, yet apparent scandal and mismanagement as Pope. We'll just briefly touch on that because we have a lot more detail and depth to go into all those things in the future. So we don't have time to go depth, deep into those things, uh, but we'll just touch on those real quick. And then uh, we'll have a, we need to give a little historical introduction to Western philosophical problems, particularly post-Trent. And that's what forms the context for phenomenology. Uh, so then we'll have the introduction to phenomenology. What is phenomenology? We'll talk about Edmund Husserl, uh, Franz Brentano, who teaches Aristotle to two Jews, a good Jew and a bad Jew. We'll talk about that. Uh, we'll talk about Augustinian phenomenology versus idealistic phenomenology. Um, we will mention St. Teresa Benedicta Acruce as well and Dietrich von Hildebrand. And then we'll talk about what is the difference between Archbishop Lefebvre's France and Wojtyla's Poland, because this is a very significant historical aspect to this. 
um, because phenomenology in Germany and Poland seems to have been significantly different than phenomenology in uh, France. And uh, also the political history of Poland and the political history of France also goes into these things uh, very deeply and helps us, gives us a very, uh, a deeper understanding and a context for understanding Lefebvre and Wojtyla. Um, then we'll talk, then we, once we get all through that introduction, I'm not even sure if we'll get to this part yet in this particular broadcast, but then we'll get much more deeper into John Paul II's uh, work uh, back when he was Carl, Carol Wojtyla, back when he was Father Carol Wojtyla, um, and then he was later Bishop Wojtyla at uh, Vatican II. Uh, we'll talk uh, about Wojtyla's Thomistic dissertation under Gary Lagrange, which was in 1947. And we'll also talk about his anti-phenomenology anti dissertation on Max Scheler. He, he, his, his dissertation was against phenomenology. It, was, it actually made a conclusion that was negative. And so we'll quote um, showing that. Uh, and then we'll talk about the, the Anglophone uh, issue that I mentioned, which comes from a, a Polish translator by the name of Tim Jenska. And she uh, falsely translated the first English translation of, of Wojtyla's major philosophical work, Person and Act, uh, into English as acting person. Uh, you know, if you, you can tell already we have a translation issue if, if the Polish says person and act, but the English says acting person just for the title. She mistranslated the title, title uh, itself. So, but we'll get into more of the content as why that's this sort of misrepresented Wojtyla's work um, and made it has has contributed to this this misunderstanding of Wojtyla that he is a phenomenologist uh, when in fact he is not a phenomenologist. We'll talk about what he really is in this uh, whole presentation. So with all that, let's talk about some of the controversy. Um, so uh, can we talk about Archbishop Lefebvre as a saint? So first of all, let me let me make clear um, there is obviously a distinction between uh, what a a, um, the, a a decreed formally recognized public saint when there's a public cultus what's called a public veneration meaning the the local bishop and or the pope has uh, formally uh, promoted the veneration of a particular saint um, but typically historically what happens is the veneration of a saint takes place before a public recognition thereof and this is was especially true before Trent. There was just public veneration happened. You know, somebody died, and then after death, he or she worked miracles. Uh, their relics were incorrupt. Uh, devotion just spread, and uh, the saint's cultus, his his cult, his veneration, the rituals surrounding his veneration, arose just organically. And then later on, the church recognized this and promulgated the decree. So it is the normal way of things that uh, a man becomes venerated as a saint before the church recognizes that. So that's, first of all, the case. Now, second of all, we need to also understand that it's perfectly normal for Catholics to believe that individual people are saints. For example, let's say your parents were particularly holy people uh, and they died. And you believe that they're saints. And so you you ask them to pray for you. You have no evidence that they're actually in purgatory or heaven. You just really believe that they are. Is a Catholic allowed to do that? Absolutely. Absolutely. There, there's nothing wrong with privately venerating a, an individual because you believe that he or she is a saint. For me personally, I am a I am a disciple of Dietrich and Alice von Hildebrand. So I, I, I certainly know that they were very holy, virtuous Catholics, faithful Catholics, died in the bosom of the church. So I, I certainly believe that they are saints, but I have no evidence and the church has not declared such. Now, there's a distinction between doing that and then forming a, a cult in the bad sense of the word. If we form a cult in the bad sense of the word around an individual and say he's a saint, uh, but the church has not recognized that, um, you know, that can be a bad thing that can and, and cults such as this have arisen for different people. And there's dangers of that happening. That's a real danger. Um, but one can do so within limits. One can say privately, my opinion 
is that the excommunication of Archbishop Lefebvre was unjust or an error or was a, a positive error on the, on the part of the uh, papal uh, decree in, in some way. So, for example, and, and sometimes, um, you know, Catholics understand this intuitively. They understand that there's a political thing going on. There's some unjust, injustice going on. An example of this, I, this, this very important example is um, Pope Martin IV. And he was a French pope that was appointed uh, pope under the pressure from St. Louis's, St. Louis the Ninth's evil brother. So King St. Louis the Ninth, a great saint, he had an evil brother. His name was Charles of Anjou. And Charles of Anjou pressured the papal conclave. They got this French pope. His name was Martin IV. And Charles of Anjou pressured Martin IV to excommunicate the Catholic emperor of Constantinople, because at that time, the churches had been reunited at the Council of Lyon. And so the, we have this wicked king who pressures a, a political pope to make a false excommunication, which he does. And then he calls a false crusade, which he does. And thank God, uh, God did not allow this false crusade to succeed in conquering Constantinople, which would have been the second conquering, second unjust conquering. So this is an example of an unjust excommunication. Another, another example is Pope Boniface VIII excommunicating unborn children. Well, that's unjust. <laughs> you, can't un, you can't excommunicate an unborn child. Um, now, but the most famous example is obviously St. Joan of Arc. Um, St. Joan of Arc was burned at the stake as a heretic by the local bishop um, in, uh, it was 14 something, I don't have the date in front of me, but it was during the, during the Hundred Years' War, it may have been late 1300s, but the Hundred Years' War stretched from mid 1300s, mid 1400s. St. Joan of Arc was excommunicated by the local bishop. He, she was, died as a heretic. She was excommunicated. Um, she was obstinate in her, uh, you know, her vocation. Okay. So obviously she was venerated by Frenchmen for centuries and centuries and centuries. And this was not even a private veneration that I'm talking about. It was definitely a public veneration. So the, the, the official church decree was that she was a heretic, basically. Um, she died excommunicated. She died outside the church formally in all the formal senses of that term. But nevertheless, she was venerated and eventually she was vindicated. So this is what some followers of Archbishop Lefebvre argue that such is the case with Archbishop Lefebvre. You can go to Kennedy Hall's channel. He has a video where he argues that Archbishop Lefebvre's death excommunicated was not actually a death excommunicated. It was not actually a, a death outside the church. Uh, one can make a reasonable argument to that to that effect, and and Kennedy does that, and you know he makes a, a reasonable and convincing argument. Now, one could also make a reasonable and convincing argument on the other side. That's reasonable, and it's within the bounds of a Catholic debate. One could have a Catholic debate and reasonably have a debate or disagreement about this, as long as everyone submits to the authority of the church and say, well, we can't create a cultist and, you know, like promulgate a lit liturgy commemorating St. Marcel Lefebvre, if and only if, uh, unless uh, there is an actual decree of his sainthood. Um, you know, the veneration of St. John of Arc went on for centuries, sort of unofficially. Um, so as long as we're not creating a real cult in, a, in the bad sense of the term, um, you know, as long as we're still working within the bounds of Catholic orthodoxy, Catholic order, the order of the church, you know, one can make a reasonable argument and one can privately venerate Archbishop Lefebvre if one believes in one's conscience that he is a saint. Now, this goes into the Catholic teaching of conscience, which we don't can't, not have time to get into, but suffice it to say that there is a true, if you're, you have a properly formed conscience, one can make a decision like this. Um, now, all I'm saying is this series is named St. John Paul II and St. Marcel Lefebvre, simply to show the fact that the followers of both of these men uh, follow their sanctity in particular. They follow them as saints. Now, obviously, St. John Paul II is officially promulgated as a saint, but we've also talked about reasonable disagreements with that as well. So 
the 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 bottom line is we're we're already spent 15 minutes on this. We're definitely not going to get through the whole presentation. The point I'm trying to simply say is that all Catholics deserve a sympathetic and charitable examination of their lives. You know, I I mean, I'm sure 100 years from now, if, if anybody cares about what Timothy Flanders said or did, uh, you know, there's a way to evaluate what I said. And I'm probably, probably going to miss a lot of things and, and uh, you know, not anticipate what, what could have happened with this or that thing and um, all sorts of blind spots that I have. Um, but the, the attitude of the church, even in the case of an excommunicated individual, because the, the law above every law is the salvation of souls, even the church, I argue, desires mercy even for the excommunicated and so did not the church rejoice at the canonization of saint john joan uh joan of arc did not the church rejoice that the ecclesiastical authority was in fact proved wrong yes because the salvation of souls is a greater glory than the uh, infallibility of the local bishop or the infallibility of the um, the excommunication. It is a greater glory for God that souls are saved than if a bishop had the proper information in his intellect to make the proper determination at this and this, this and that time. So that is the motivation for this series. It is to provide a sympathetic view of both men, which Christian charity demands that we do. And um, truth and charity demand that we do so as objectively as possible, uh, submissive to the authority of the church, uh, but and within these bounds as Catholics. So that's all for the public portion of this, this video. Um, so if you want the full presentation on why John Paul II was not a phenomenologist and all this, you have to go to patreon.com slash meaning of Catholic. You can also donate at meaning of Catholic.com slash uh, donate, or you can contact. Uh, if you can't afford it, you can always get free membership as well. So uh, contact me at meaningofcatholic.com slash contact. Okay.